Good morning and praise the Lord. It is indeed a great joy for Wals and I to be back with you again here in this IBF conference and to enjoy this sweet and wonderful time of friendship and fellowship together and to partner together in the great work of the Lord and to mutually edify and encourage uh, one another. As we have been singing, we are here to enjoy the presence of the Lord and to confess his name and to once again to acknowledge that he is the Lord of our life. And sometimes we go through deep valleys of life, sometimes are great times of celebrations and joy, but we know that the Lord is leading us in his goodness and in his greatness and in his faithfulness and he will never leave us nor forsake us. So we are safe in him. We are sealed for eternity and our eternal destiny is sealed in him and that is a great and encouraging thought for me to share with you this morning. So let us share our sorrows together and uh, comfort one another and minister from God's abundant grace uh, as we spend these few days uh, here in this campus. You know, I always feel that when I come back to IBF that uh, we have left something last year and we want to continue that this year and that is the reason uh, we have come back. And uh, I always feel that we are continuing a conversation we left last year which uh, we could not complete. And that conversation is about our Lord, about his word, about our ministry, about our family, about our children, about how the Lord is using us and what are the struggles of our life and to pray for one another and to renew our friendship and fellowship together. So we are continuing that even this morning and the Lord will definitely bless us through his word and through his uh, uh, spirit. Uh, I always uh, think that it is, uh, you know, a great uh, encouragement as we get together. We have a tremendous opportunity to study God's precious word together from different uh, men of God who are called by the Lord and equipped by the Lord and uh, by the enlightenment the Lord has given to them uh, over his holy word when they share something either in the workshop or uh, when they share something to us personally or from the pulpit. That may be God's word to us for that day or for that season, and there is tremendous blessing and power in it. So what happier thing could we do together than going back to the word of God and speak the things that become sound doctrine? So shall we turn to Genesis chapter 4, and we will briefly take a look at the first family, that is Adam and Eve, the first family. You know, many social anthropologists believe that family is an endangered species, especially in the Western culture. And there are so many sociologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, marriage counselors and experts uh, and uh, various other people who are ready and willing to help people who are facing challenges and crises in their family life. And some of them are good, they do it from a biblical Christian perspective, others do it from a secular perspective. But all of them believe that we are in a crisis and uh, family is an endangered species, so we ought to be present to help people in their crisis and in their sorrows. Parents and children today, including all of us, we face tremendous pressure, a host of pressure and problems that uh, probably that were seldom encountered in the last uh, generation. Sometimes we are intimidated, sometimes we are discouraged and challenged uh, to see the tragic breakdown of families. Many years ago, I read a book by one of my professors, Howard Hendricks, and the title of the book was, Heaven Help the Home. That means a plea, a cry, heaven, please help the home. After preparing this message, I thought of rewriting that title because I was so encouraged to see some wonderful truths in God's word 
So if I rewrite that book or if I write one, I will give a new title. Heaven helps the home. Heaven is there to help the home. So that is the encouragement. That is the blessing. That is the inspiration and motivation we have as we look into God's word. I'm a grandfather now, praise the Lord. And young people, we are so delighted to see many of you here. And, uh, you know, in the initial years of the IBF conference, we could see many energetic young people coming from the Northeast, especially from New York. But now this year, we are so much blessed to see young people from various places, especially from the great big state of Texas. And we are so proud of that. So I'm sure that, you know, they will have a tremendous ministry here in this conference, and they will take the things that they hear from the conference, and they will do business with it for God's glory. Now, as a father and as a grandfather, and uh, I'm sure that all of you older parents and grandparents would join with me in that confession that we had so many black, uh, blind spots in our parenting. We have made mistakes. We did not have many resources. We were not, never trained for that. We lacked the skill and understanding to deal with many situations. But over a period of time, all through these experiences, the positive thing is that the Lord has taught us wonderful lessons through his word and through our experiences and has equipped us authoritatively to proclaim something from the word of God and from our experience to the next generation, including our children. So even though we are not perfect, we have learned quite a lot, wonderful lessons, and we are so delighted and excited to share that with you. I will be particularly focusing on the young parents and those who are contemplating, praying, and planning for their parenthood. And there are tremendous resources in the Word of God. I would like to highlight some of them for you uh, this morning. Uh, Genesis chapter 4 gives us a picture of the first family. It was an ideal family in a near perfect condition. Adam and Eve blessed with uh, two wonderful children, Cain and Abel. And uh, there are some very foundational lessons for shepherding in the home in the first few verses of Genesis chapter 4. Now, this message is applicable for all of us. Some of the aspects of shepherding are particularly geared toward elders or deacons or leaders. But as far as this session is concerned and some of the other sessions that would follow, this is applicable to all of us. All of us are called into shepherding. The old Puritans in church history they called the pastoral ministry as the cure of souls and the care of souls. So we are in the business of, in the cure of souls. It's a healing ministry as we heard last evening. A ministry of healing, a ministry of encouragement. Of course there is correction and exhortation, admonition, warning, guidance, discipline, counseling, instruction. But above all of that, ultimately, it should lead us to some touch of healing somewhere. So that is the cure of souls. It is also, we are talking about the care of souls. Whether it is for children, whether it is for new believers, whether it is for sisters, whether it is for elders, shepherding, the great pastoral work which the Lord has committed to his church and we all have been enlisted and called and recruited, ordained and commended to that noble task, irrespective of our age and experience. So this is for you, this is for me, and this is for all of us. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, I'm reading from the New King James translation. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I got him. That is what the literal Hebrew reads. I have acquired a man from the Lord. It is not just a statement like that. 
it is an exclamation of great excitement. I have got him. I got him. I have acquired him from the Lord. Dear parents, dear friends, brothers and sisters, young parents, this is where shepherding in the family begins. The sense that I have got him, I have got her, my child, from the Lord. Cain means acquired of the Lord, from the Lord. So, let us, uh, you know, read it with that same exclamation and excitement. I have acquired a man from the Lord. Here he is. I have gotten him. I got him. From where? From the Lord. A stewardship, a treasure from the Lord. That little child in my hand, that grandchild, that little baby, that child with whom the Lord has blessed you or going to bless you, the shepherding begins when you acknowledge that. I got him from the Lord. So I got him, I received, and it is from the Lord. So that is where, that's a foundational truth of shepherding in the home. That sense of stewardship that the Lord has given this child to me to take care of that child and to bring that child, bring them up. Why that verb, bring them up? Because they are not able to get there by themselves. That is why you have to bring them. They are not able to get there. So, a great responsibility, bring them up in the fear, uh, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it is a stewardship. Stewardship in the Bible is always associated with accountability and responsibility. I got him from the Lord. I'm a steward. I got her from the Lord. I'm a steward. I'm responsible. I'm accountable. This is God's gift and this is God's blessing. That awareness, that understanding, that simple truth is the foundational truth of shepherding in the home. Verse 2. Then she bore again, uh, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. See, they had different uh, occupations and different career, different aptitudes, different interests, and different abilities. Cain was different, Abel was different in their profession, in their education, in their career, in their intellectual ability, and in their social life. In all areas of their life, they were different. And the parents are supposed to understand that. And I'm sure especially we Indian parents. And that is probably one area we had some deficiency in the past generation. We know that our children, you know, they have probably found that mistake on our part, and I'm sure they won't make that mistake. That is, all of them cannot be the same. The Lord has designed that they have to be in different professions, different careers. They have different abilities. They have different interests and different aptitudes. And uh, that is another important lesson in shepherding, a very practical truth. So when we know that, the way we relate to them and encourage them also will be on the basis of their abilities, their aptitudes. We are not pressurizing them to be someone whom they cannot, who they cannot. Or we are not pushing them to a goal where they can never achieve. They are different. One is a tiller of the ground. The other is a keeper of the sheep. That is a valuable parental lesson in shepherding in the home. The Lord gave to Adam and Eve. Your children are different. No, shepherding in the home, it's a challenge. It is a very difficult task to a great extent, but heaven helps the home. The Lord's word is clear, giving us some very, very simple principles. And if we honor those principles, the Lord will be there to bless us. They are different. And that is a very important factor 
which uh, we should consider and we should uh, pass on to the next generation, we who are in the older generation. And uh, our dear young friends, those who are in the young generation, young parents, this is where shepherding in the home begins. Another important truth here in verse 3, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. You know, in the course of time, in the process of time, most translations uh, translate it as in the process of time, in the course of time, uh, the Net Bible translate it as probably more accurately as in Hebrew, at the dis designated time. At the designated time. I believe both ideas are correct to, uh, to some extent. In the process of time, in the course of time, or at the designated time, they came to worship the Lord. So in the process of time, the training was given, the teaching was given at home about the importance of sacrifice and in the importance of praise and worship and offering. So if you take the translation in the process of time, there was a time in which they were taught. There was a period, a season in which as they were growing up, this was taught to them. That is the third lesson in shepherding in the first uh, family here. In the process of time, the parents had an opportunity. Once they leave home, we don't have that opportunity. Once they are in that volcano stage of in the junior high, entering into the junior high. No, I call it the volcano stage when 12, 13, entering into that teenage time. They start acting very differently, trying to relate to us very differently and remind us that we also need to know the changes that are taking place in them and make sure that we also need to consider those changes and we also have to act differently, change some of our attitudes. Even before they even get to that stage, at a very early stage, in the process of time, teach them the most important lesson of worship. You know, that is emphasized here because that is the most important thing. Acknowledging God as the creator and redeemer, great God who needs to be praised and worshipped and who is the Lord of all, and your life needs to be insufficient to him more than to your parents as you grow up. He is over all. Now there are other spiritual lessons that need to be taught, but the first lesson is on worship and offering in the process of time. And at the designated time, see, I'm bringing the other shade of meaning. At the designated time, Cain and Abel, brought their offering to the Lord. Now, I'm not here to talk about the offering and the differences and how the Lord was pleased in Abel's offering. That is not our topic. Our topic is shepherding in the home. So, three important, wonderful, foundational truths. Now, this is not in the notes. You know, one thing interesting about the notes, IBF wants us to prepare it as early as we can. And sometimes, you know, they send us reminders, you know. What about your notes? Now, since I travel quite a lot, whenever I get time, I try to, you know, put my thoughts together and pray. And uh, even before four or eight weeks, I try to send it. But sometimes, even after preparing all that, when the real struggle comes two weeks before about the message and the final preparation and delivery, the Lord said, set this aside. I'm going to tell you something new. You know, so this is kind of something new that occurred in my mind about the first family, and that is the reason that it is not in the notes. So I got him. Number one, it is a stewardship. Number two, their differences should be considered, and they should be encouraged, motivated, inspired, guided, and helped on the basis of that difference. No comparison and no contrast. Now, that is a very important shepherding factor. And the third one, the importance of teaching them the fundamental lessons in relation to the importance of worship. 
the importance of praise and the importance of adoration and bringing in offering. Now, taught them the importance of worship and the ways of the Lord, to use a broad term. And when they did that, Adam and Eve modeled it before them. As parents, they worship the Lord. That is why in the process of time, this could be accomplished. If they would not go to church or if they were careless about their family altar and praise and worship, you know, this cannot be really taught to the children. They not only taught what they taught, I believe, they modeled it. That is the reason in the process of time, at the designated time, these two young boys, they willingly came with responsibility to offer their offerings and sacrifice before the Lord. They came at the designated time, in the process of time, because the importance of this was taught to them and their parents modeled it. Now I want to tell you a very sobering and a very solemn truth. Finally, what happened to Cain? He did not follow in the ways of the Lord. He became a rebel, and he even became a murderer. What does that teach us? In spite of the good upbringing, in spite of the godliness in the home, in spite of model parents, excellent childhood, and good uh, bringing up child rearing, near perfect environment in the Garden of Eden, intimate and direct communication with God and from God, and very close and intimate fellowship with the Lord, direct revelatory word from the Lord every day, you cannot beat that. There cannot be nothing nobler and greater in your experience than that. That was a perfect environment. In spite of that, Cain did not make it. That's a tragic reality, but a hard reality, which should be actually a comforting thought to us, that a person, a child, goes astray, not necessarily because of the lack of godliness at home, as sometimes we think, and sometimes we take a false guilt trip, even after doing your best. Now, even if we haven't done our best, we have to be sorry for it. But I know many parents, many of you have shared some of your struggles with me. I have probably shared some of mine with you. You know, this is candid camera. We have to be open. We have to be honest. And that is how the Lord blesses us in spite of the near ideal perfect condition in the paradise, Cain was lost. And that is possible in a fallen world even today. So don't go on an unnecessary guilt trip if you have conscientiously, sincerely done your part for the Lord. Why did that happen to Cain? because of the outworking of his own sinful nature. Verse 7, chapter 4. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Sin at the door. Ungodly son of godly parents, a hard reality which we must be aware of in shepherding in the home. We cannot run away from that. I wish I would not have said that, but you know, this is a hard reality. We don't want to talk about it, but we need to. That is how shepherding takes place. That is how we are energized in shepherding our children. And that is the right attitude toward shepherding, committing them to the Lord. Now, people are lost. Our children are lost sometimes, God forbid, that it is because of the outworking of their own sinful hearts. May the Lord deliver them from that trap and that situation. So let us do our part faithfully and honestly. 
the foundational three truths from Genesis chapter 4. A contrast to Cain, what about Joseph? A deceptive father, oh, tell me more about that, you know. He was a carnal father, not a very spiritual man. He will just go to the meeting, sit at the back, and then come home. Not very much interested. He was, you know, trying to manipulate the situations all the time. Not a very godly father. Then, a deceitful father, he probably did not get very good spiritual upbringing, Joseph, when he was growing up. And not only that, a kind of a group of terrorist brothers, very violent, you know, a, 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 a bunch of uh, near terrorists. And they were his brothers. So that was not a very ideal situation, violent brothers. Let me say he did not, I guess he did not get any spiritual support from his family. But Joseph is one of the godliest man we find in the scriptures. So what happened? Is it because of godliness in the home? Or it is because of the support of the family? All those are important, but ultimately that is not the factor. It is a person's devotion and commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and his personal commitment to love the Lord and know the Lord. And that should be our prayer and our focus. So, ungodly son of godly parents and a very godly son of an ungodly father and violent brothers, that is Joseph. You know, a tremendous uh, picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and a wonderful illustration of the character and the purity of our Lord Jesus Christ we find uh, in uh, Joseph. That should be encouraging to us. These are two stark contrasts and realities all parents should bear in mind as they pray for their children. And these are some of the things, hard realities we must be aware of. And young parents, those who are preparing for parenthood, I believe this is a good preparation for you. More than any other worldly wisdom and counsel and training, these important uh, nuggets of truth the Spirit of God inspires in your heart this morning can really encourage you, give you guidance in parenting at home. One more verse briefly, and that is very familiar, then we will try to go back to our notes to give some very practical counseling points in relation to shepherding uh, in the home. The second uh, verse, and the, that is uh, briefly mentioned in our notes also, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Very familiar uh, verses, and uh, most of us probably uh, know this by heart. This is a very important verse in relation to shepherding in the home. And when we think about shepherding in the home, the book of Deuteronomy is a wonderful book, especially chapters, chapter 6, where the admonition is given to the parents in bringing up the children in the fear of the Lord. In the New Testament, uh, chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians. Two things that must be taught to children at the very earliest stage. In the book of Genesis, it was about worship and about praise and bringing offering. Along with that, in the New Testament, Apostle Paul's counsel, chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Then verse 2, honor. The first one is an action, obedience. The second one is an attitude, honor. The first one, action, that has to continue for some time, as long as the child is under the roof of the parents, living with the parents. Then he becomes adult, he, becomes, he moves out. Then, 
or he establishes his own home or her own home, then it is not a question of obedience. What do I expect from my children, even when they are adults, even then when they have moved out of the home? I don't expect them to obey. I'm not commanding them for anything. That stage is over. But whether they honor and respect daddy and mommy, that attitude is very precious. It is a lifelong thing. And it is a light, lifelong obligation on your part. Not obedience. I know some of you are smiling happy. Oh, I don't have to obey, you know. Yeah, that's true. That stage will be over very soon. But some of you right now, it's the time for obedience and honor. For some of you, the time has already come that you are not in that action stage anymore. You have done your part, praise the Lord. You might have messed up also, you know. But that stage is over. I know you are smiling, you know. Yeah. And uh, because the next stage is the stage of honoring. That is a lifelong commitment. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, he extended that truth and said, uh, all the parents here are going to like it, you know, that the Lord Jesus Christ clearly taught that, that honor also includes providing for their material needs when they need it. Aha! Uh -huh. You want to invite me next year also? Yeah. <laughs> that is... The Lord, I don't have time to, you know, get into those passages. The Lord Jesus Christ extended this truth. And even in the Old Testament, when the commandment was given, it was implied that the parents may reach a stage, and in, at that stage, they may need not just the attitude of respect from you, they may need little help. Not all of them, not always, but there may be some situations, seasons, and stages in their life when they need it. And uh, it is your duty, obligation to fulfill that. So action and attitude. Paul said those are the two important things that must be thought, uh, taught at the very early stage. You know, one, of, one, one kind of a, a very important, a hard truth, many of us uh, older parents have learned, you can do this only at a very early stage. After the child crosses a certain developmental stage in his or her life, you can teach these things. Even if we teach, it won't be effective. That is why the Word of God emphasizes this truth from a counseling perspective. These are the first things, the primary things you should teach. Children obey your parents, because by learning to obey the parents, it, be, it is the gateway to obedience to the Lord in the future. Acknowledging authority and submission. In the earlier verses, Paul was talking about the spirit-filled life. One of the results of being filled by the Holy Spirit is submission. And that submission is for all of us, you know. There is a general sense in which that submission pervades all areas of our relationship. A spirit-filled husband, a spirit-filled wife, a spirit-filled employer, a spirit-filled employee, a spirit-filled father, and a spirit-filled child. When that child uh, reaches that stage of knowing the truth, of the gospel and receiving the Lord and the importance of being under the control of the Holy Spirit. So submission is the most important thing mentioned here and how that is applicable to children. Children obey, acknowledge the authority, recognize the authority of your parents. And when children don't acknowledge the authority of the parents, that is not at all, that's a very dangerous sign. That is why that is the first thing. So, the first lesson here in the New Testament in relation to shepherding in the home is teaching them the value of obedience and the attitude of, attitude of honoring the parents. 
So let us pray that the Lord may help us to see these things clearly and put them in the proper perspective and take these as the priorities of shepherding. Then, in that verse 3, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Verse 4, and you fathers. Now, the word used here for fathers, mothers, you are not exempted here. Because uh, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23, the same word, Greek word, is translated as the parents. Moses' parents. It is the same word. So it, is, it can be translated either as fathers or as parents. So I believe, you know, when we take it as fathers, definitely fathers have a priestly role they are the managers, they are the ones who preside and lead. But at the same time, the mother also plays a very decisive role in shepherding, a probably a greater role in the practical outworking of the shepherding as the father gives leadership to it. So the same word is used in Hebrews 11.23 for the parents of Moses, not just the father of Moses. So what shall we do, uh, parents? Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up, because they will not get there by themselves. You have to guide them. You have to direct them. You have to help them in the training and admonition uh, of the Lord. In the training and admonition of the Lord, or uh, old KJV, I believe, translated as uh, nurture. Uh, of the Lord. Do not provoke. Do not be embittered towards them. Don't stir up anger in them. Don't exasperate them. Because by the father's authority and sturdiness, the father or the parents can provoke wrath, anger in them and can discourage them. So, See, in the ancient world, when Paul was writing this in the Greco-Roman world, the father had uh, absolute authority. He could do anything to his child. And the children were not protected by law when Paul wrote this. So it was a revolutionary concept that a child's welfare must be taken into consideration in a Christian home, don't listen to the Greco-Roman cultural garbage. That's what Paul is saying. Even though the worldly law did not protect them, God's law protects the children. Parents, be aware of that as you live in that culture, in that cultural milieu and context. It was a revolutionary thought. It is not the absolute authority of the father. Children, do not provoke children. They would laugh at that idea, you know. Why are you concerned about your children? Paul said, you need to be. That is what the Lord expects of you to do. Now, I thought about some of the practical ways through which we have provoked our children. Some of you like that, eh? Okay. Or... We provoke our children, knowingly, most of the time, unknowingly. You know how innocent we are. So uh, it, is, it comes out of sometimes ignorance or carelessness, you know. We provoke our children through our own carelessness or selfishness, unnecessary authoritarianism, over-domineering spirit. It can provoke them. Overprotection can provoke them. Overly restricting freedom. Restrictions, rules and guidance are very important, but stretching it too much also can be a kind of provoking them to anger. Comparing children with each other, showing favoritism and partiality. We provoke them through all this. Pressuring and pushing children for achievements beyond their reasonable bounds. Discouraging them by our lack of appreciation, affirmation, and exaggerating their faults. Ooh, tell me more about that. Eh? 
exaggerating their faults. You know, sometimes we do these things innocently, but it can have a very negative effect upon them. Using love as a tool to reward them and not giving them the impression that we love them unconditionally. We love them on the basis of conditions. We do these things, you know, out of goodwill, out of our love for them, no doubt about that. But sometimes it can be counterproductive. So that is why that negative instruction, do not provoke. And then bring them up. The positive, the encouragement, in the, in the nurture, in the training. The word there is actually training or discipline. Uh, uh, and then the next word is admonition uh, of the Lord. Now the idea of correction, uh, discipline and correction. Train up a child in the way he should go. Admonition is more of instruction. So there is a fine difference between the nuances of this word. The first one, nurture or training. That is the first one, like train up a child. It is uh, more of discipline. The word is translated in KJV as chastisement in Hebrews chapter 12. You know, that chastising, that discipline. It is with care and with love. And then the training, there it is the idea of correction more in the first word. In the second word, admonition, the idea is more of instruction, putting into mind by word of mouth. It is a word used in counseling even today, you know, so that it remind them, positively reinforce and remind, remind them by verbal instruction. Give them advice and encouragement. Child education beginning at home. Do this as unto the Lord and uh, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So bring them up. Do not provoke them. Train them and instruct them. See, these are the basic things, you know. I know that many of us, we do not go to classes where they teach us how to bring up our children. Many of us don't have, many of you don't have time for that. That is not the most essential thing. You know, some of it can be helpful if you need it, and if you think it is important, by all, all means, go to a godly counselor, a biblical counselor who can help you. But more than that, I believe, if we are aware of these fundamental truths, and ask the Lord, Lord, help me, I want to put this into practice, I want to honor it. What precious truths in the book of Deuteronomy, Genesis chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 6. What wonderful words of instruction to me as a parent. What wonderful words of instruction to our children. Let us learn it together. And I'm sure heaven helps the home. The Lord will bless us together for his uh, glory. No doubt ab about that. So it is a, a wonderful truth. Let me remind you for your encouragement and for my own encouragement. It is not an endangered species. In the will and plan of God, it is a protected species. Family is a protected species. God protects it. God honors anyone who honors the values and the guidelines God has in place for parents. So whenever I read that family is an endangered species, you know, after going through all this, I get the impression, Lord, that is not right. Heaven helps the home, and it is a protected species. Now going back to our, our books, I want to show you some uh, very important practical tips in relation to uh, shepherding uh, in the home. Page 12. In any shepherding ministry, whether it is pastoral shepherding of the elders or parental shepherding or shepherding for new believers, there are six integrant components. And uh, even from the early time of the Puritans, 
they developed a theology of pastoral ministry in which, you know, many of them highlighted that six integrant components are essential to any pastoral shepherding ministry. And uh, these six integrant components are clearly revealed in the scriptures. Number one is intimacy, developing a caring relationship. Unless and until you have a caring relationship with your child or with the sheep, as we heard last night, you cannot develop a shepherding ministry. Relationship is crucial. Otherwise, we can forget shepherding. Number two, an old, you know, archaic word, tutelage. That is, as a tutor, give some tuition, instruction, providing instruction to the child. Verbal instruction is always important. Now, some stream of psychology and psychiatry today emphasizes modeling as the only way of instruction, not verbal. That is a lie. There is modeling and there is verbal. The Word of God always emphasizes both. So, teaching and training, verbal instruction, coupled with modeling. Guidance, they need direction. The sheep always need direction. And this morning when we apply that to our own children, you know, that they definitely need a lot of direction in relation to their marriage, their, counts, their career, in relation to important decision, maybe, import, maybe even in other matters of life, which we may not consider as very significant. Consolation, the care of souls, the healing ministry, giving comfort, motivation, and encouragement. Guardianship, somebody is there to care for you. You know, when somebody tells, shakes my hand and tells you, Alex, we love you and care for you, ah, that makes my day. Because that we, are, we, we all are prone to enjoy that sense of guardianship. Even though, you know, my parents are not alive, some of the older uncles and aunties who have known me and my father and mother for many years, when they hug me and say something, a word of encouragement, that's a kind of guardianship that builds in kind of an electricity of inspiration in me, an encouragement which no, you know, I cannot achieve in any other way. The guardianship, how much more our children, those who are weak and those who are helpless need it. The sense of providing and protecting and above all, intercession. Intimacy, tutelage, guidance, Consolation, guardianship, and intercession, six integrant components of counseling. A very important verse, this one we should read, and that is that comes from uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 14, that in our counseling ministry, in helping, in shepherding our children, all of us can do something. All parents, God has equipped all of us, or God will equip, Verse 14, Romans 15, verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, or able also to admonish one another. You are able. If you are filled with goodness, filled with God's knowledge, if you are walking with the Lord, if you love the Lord, if you are living under the Lordship of Christ, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, don't worry about your educational qualification, your skills and your ability. Paul tells, without making any distinction, to all believers in Rome, I am confident. How can he make that assertion? I am confident about one thing, you believers in Rome, that you are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. And as William's translation puts it, you are competent to counsel one another. You know that J. Adams developed his nuthetic counseling on the basis of this verse, that you are competent to counsel one another. Counseling is not for experts alone. Counseling is for you, elders and parents, evangelists and deacons. It is a vital part of Christian ministry in shepherding. 
you are competent to counsel and uh, i have in the notes given some verses related to counseling in the bible on page uh, 13 admonition encouragement help then other complementary words teaching and stimulating reconciling and the fourfold use of scripture how scripture equips us and encourages us in counseling and helping one another i hope we are encouraged we are motivated we are inspired we can do this job in a better way by depending upon the lord not only heaven help home heaven helps the home family is a protected species the lord is on our side and as we depend upon him and as we cast ourselves in our helplessness to him and as we follow this simple divine instructions the spirit of god assures us this morning that we are competent to counsel and help our children may the lord bless us with these words